Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome very warmly to the fall 2017 Richard von Weizsäcker Lecture at the American Academy in Berlin. And of course, a warm and very vigorous welcome to our lecturer, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, university professor at Columbia University in New York City, and a founding member of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. It is also a distinct pleasure to welcome back Gerhard Kasper, my predecessor as president of the American Academy and currently our co-vice chair of the Board of Trustees. Ladies and gentlemen, the names Richard von Weizsäcker and Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak may in fact, I haven't looked this up, but may be pair tonight for the first time. Uh, if, if that is the case, the combination is not an accident of the American Academy. It is precisely the identity of the American Academy to associate names such as these two humanists in the broadest sense of the word. Richard von Weizsäcker, as this audience knows, was a founder of the American Academy. As former vice president of the Bundestag, governing mayor of West Berlin from 1981 to 1984, and president of Germany from 1984 to 1994, von Weizsäcker's career was marked by the strong advocacy of democratic principles, tolerance, and the confrontation with Germany's historical and social responsibility. He was considered the conscience of the Federal Republic of Germany, perhaps most especially in May 1985, when he delivered one of the most important speeches of the post-war period on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Richard von Weizsäcker was a regular visitor to the Academy, and please allow me the personal recollection of one of the most cherished memories of my own fellowship semester in 2003, when he spoke with us fellows in the library across the floor here, the room he referred to as his second favorite room in Berlin. Of course, we asked him immediately what his favorite room was, and his answer was the Philharmonie. <laughs> Gayatri Spivak's career is legendary for its service to the two sides of the humanities. On one side, the humanistic tradition and its focus on scholarship, on literature, philosophy, on the intricacies of language, and the other side, the human, the service to humanity, to social improvement, which is always also a political goal. Spivak is perhaps best known for her essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, and for her translation of and introduction to Jacques Derrida's De la Grammatologie on Grammatology. In 2012, she was awarded the Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy for being, and I quote the prize language, a critical theorist and educator speaking for the humanities against intellectual colonialism in relation to the globalized world. In 2013, she received the Padma Bhushan, the third highest civilian award given by the Republic of India. Gayatri Spivak completed her secondary education at St. John's Diocesan Schools, a girls' uh, higher uh, secondary school, going on to attend Presidency College of the University of Calcutta. In 1961, she joined the graduate program in English at Cornell University, completing her PhD there at, in comparative literature while teaching at the University of Iowa. Her dissertation, advised by Paul Dumont, was on W.B. Yeats and titled, Myself Must I Remake the Life and Poetry of W.B. Yeats. In 1974, at the University of Iowa, she founded the MFA, Masters of Fine Arts in Translation in the Department of Comparative Literature and in 1978 was named National Humanities Professor at the University of Chicago. Following appointments at the University of Texas, Austin, Emory University, and the University of Pittsburgh, she moved to Columbia University in 1991. In 2007, she was named University Professor in the Humanities, the first woman of color ever to be awarded this prestigious position in Columbia's 260-year history, and she remains the only University Professor in the Humanities. She has received 11 honorary doctorates and has served on the advisory board of numerous academic journals, including Differences, Signs, uh, the Journal of Women and Culture and Society, and Diaspora, the Journal of Transnational Studies. 
In addition to Can the Subaltern Speak, an essay first delivered in 1983, her published work includes Critique of Postcolonial Reason Towards a History of the Vanishing Present, 1999, In Other Worlds, 1987, Outside, In the Teaching Machine, 1993, Death of a Discipline, 2003, Other Asias, 2008, uh, and An Aesthetic Education in the Age of Globalization, 2012. She is currently at work on an annotated translation of the prison correspondence between Antonio Gramsci and the Schucht sisters, uh, Gramsci's wife and sister-in-law, and a book, as I think many of you know, on the great African-American thinker W.E.B. Du Bois, who in fact spent two student years in Berlin in the 1890s studying with Gustav von Schmoller, Adolf Wagner, and this is always a surprise to me, Heinrich von Treitschke. <laughs> Spivak's work on Du Bois is complemented by her ardent campaign to aid and indeed to rescue the Du Bois archives in Accra, Ghana, another dimension and purpose of her trip to Berlin, which will also include the W.E.B. Du Bois lecture at the Humboldt Universität on Thursday evening. Since 1986, Spivak has been engaged in teaching and training adults and children among the landless illiterates on the border of West Bengal and Bihar Jharkhand. She has established the Paris Chandra and Sivani Chakravorty Memorial Foundation for Rural Education. The group, on their own initiative, is now attempting to bring about a farmer's cooperative based on natural fertilizers and natural seeds, a mind-changing project against the exploitation of the poor that they have undertaken themselves, moved by Spivak's repeated descriptions of the effects of chemical fertilizers and hybrid seeds on the health of the community. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the lecture will be followed uh, by a question and answer period. Uh, we welcome your questions. Uh, when you receive the microphone, uh, please introduce yourself extremely briefly, uh, and uh, please leave a little bit of time for your successors also to ask questions, uh, and afterwards we obviously invite you cordially uh, to a reception uh, in the living room. Now please join me in welcoming Professor Gayatri Spivak. Thank you, Michael, for that very generous introduction. The, um, it's always such a pleasure to be introduced by a friend. You feel the, the warmth and you feel, well, I'm at home here. And so that's how I proceed. I give you this warning as I begin. Now, there's no clock here, is there? Well, I'll do my best. Um, I am indeed deeply honored to have been invited to a visit visitorship at this most distinguished institution, the American Academy of Berlin. In my abstract, which some of you may have read, I said that I would consider W.E.B. Du Bois in the great diversity of his positions from the American, quote, Negro, you can hear my, uh, the mic's picking me up, right? Last stroke and hear me, okay. From the American, quote, Negro, all the way to global communism and Pan-Africanism, with reference to his literary and autobiographical works as well. For the last eight years, I have been engaged in attempting to cross this diversity without ancestor worship. This is a, 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 a tendency we also have in India of ancestor worshiping criticism, and I try to avoid it as much as I can. The old guy is my neighbor, after all. I live in uh, Washington Heights, and his best years were spent on Sugar Hill, it's walking distance. The, um, now, uh, I want to give an account of this as best I can, but I want to begin with a few photographs, actually one photograph, of the neglect that is being visited upon the core collection with which this extraordinary man left the United States in residence um, uh, in 1962 at the invitation of Kwame Nkrumah, the first president 
of Ghana to take up his last residence in Accra. The, um, Africa has not given uh, the spirit of Du Bois a home. You notice the doors are open because there's no air conditioning and there's no bibliographer. There's no, uh, there are no computers. They're shown and people touch these things. Uh, they, uh, there's mouse droppings inside. The pages are very dry because there's no air conditioning. And the ones who show these books are national uh, service uh, teenagers. They come and go, so there's no continuity. And it really breaks your heart to see that this unique, it is a unique collection. There are things in there that there, you won't see in any other collection, including the Schomburg, in the world. And so I thought that I would begin by this gesture of this is the exact opposite of ancestor worship. The, um, I have shifted my focus since I wrote in the abstract that I would consider his analysis of the emergence of US, quote, abolition democracy as reflected in his massive black reconstruction. That abstract was written in August. In September, I started co-teaching a course with Mama Dujuf on pan-Africanism and post-colonialism. This topic seems to me more to touch the limits of Du Bois's range than would an analysis of US democracy. I mean, which is, of course, part of my, my book whenever it gets finished, so it's not like I'm turning my back on that topic, but I thought this would be more um, connected to the range. It situates enslavement in the American context as producing the African-American as a peculiar agent of undoing the color line. In September, I also started reading an outstanding book that teaches us how to think this production of the African-American as a peculiar agent, as constituted by Du Bois. The book is X, The Problem of the Negro as a Problem for Thought, by Naam Dimitri Chandler, which I hope some of you have looked at. I might even say that I have encountered myself through this text because the author has established many connections with my own way of thinking, although he does better, but he has, which I had lost touch with as I moved forward learning from my mistakes and becoming somewhat more vulgar as the years rolled by. Chandler's point is that Du Bois's sustained autobiographical use of himself as an example theorizes how to think being and knowing as such within the problematic of difference as the historical. In an essay called The Negro Mind Reaches Out, summarizing his experience at the Pan-African Congresses, Du Bois writes, and I quote, the race problem is the other side of the labor problem, and the black man's burden is the white man's burden. Empire is the heavy hand of capital abroad. What might happen if Europe became suddenly shadowless if Asia and Africa and the islands were suddenly cut away. And goes on then to differentiate between and among various kinds of imperialisms. Chandler does not in fact consider this essay, but his methodological lesson for us is that when we read such a piece of writing, we should try to understand it also as establishing how to think the human indifference as such, being and knowing, ontology and epistemology in general, not just the African-American as different from the Euro-US as the same. I would like to go on to suggest that if you take the specificity and the generality of this difference seriously, specificity as well as generality, as does Chandler, we would see the differentiations within colonial practice as the moment where, in actual practice, it establishes the possibility of translating the general theory into unmediated practice as such. As we were discussing this yesterday evening, Michael asked the very pertinent question, is he universalizing Chandler? An important question, Chandler, 
must taken by the early Derrida is not universalizing, but rather speculating about undoing Europe as the same over against which difference is computed. Indeed, he fascinatingly compares Du Bois's commitment to taking autobiography as an example of the problem of constituting a general ontology and epistemology with Derrida's description of Husserl, so that this is not taken as just something specific to the color line. Derrida's description of Husserl's search for the origin of objectivity. Husserl, and I quote, I quote Derrida, Husserl had to navigate logicizing structuralism and psychologistic geneticism. Derrida writes about Husserl's origin of geometry. So logic and psychology, specificity and generality. This common root of structure and genesis, he continues, which is dogmatically presupposed by all the ulterior ulterior problematics was the problem that was already Husserl's, Derrida writes. That is, the problem of the foundation of objectivity. And that's what Chandler is looking at. Remember, please, we are speaking of being ever mindful of a problem, not of a universalizing solution. As a practical classroom teacher, I ask my students to track the universalizable within these problematics without universalizing. A hard thing to learn because we are not mindful of the problem. As I have just indicated, I would like to entertain this thought in the context of colonialism, to which Du Bois was extending the problem of the color line, as we saw in those passages in from The Negro Mind Reaches Out. So by 1925, which is the date of that piece, Du Bois is weaving together race, labor, and empire. Labor brings in class. Du Bois's gender politics will be touched upon briefly by the end of these remarks, but they're not quite on the same level at all as these wonderful considerations um, show. Uh, the, before I consider the, this implication that labor brings in class, I must show how Du Bois's pan-Africanism is different from other versions. I will focus on four typical but different examples. Flora Shaw, Lady Lugard, Edmund Blyden, Marcus Garvey, and George Padmore. I will go by way of the colonization of India by the British, not generally mentioned by Chandler, and of course not considered by Du Bois in his 1925 essay, since that is part of Alain Locke's well-known volume, The New Negro, so obviously it's not. The first idea of Pan-Africanism focused on the Islamic millennium that allegedly united Africa before European colonialism, coming from Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan, all the way to the Gold Coast, generally by way of the already existing African empires, today contained in the notion of Ifriqiya. There is a spectacular account of this in a book with a long title, A Tropical Dependency, an outline of the ancient history of the Western Sudan, with an account of the modern settlement of northern Nigeria. Still considered authoritative by some, by a woman called Flora Shaw, a British journalist who supposedly is the origin of the name Nigeria, and who subsequently married a British administrator, Lord Lugard, and she published this book in 1906. Not only did Flora Shaw believe in the prefiguration of Pan-Africanism, in the Islamic millennium, she also held the common view implicit in this, today usually toned down, that below this Ifriqiya, that Flora Shaw called Negro land, were swamps where lived cannibals and the lowest examples of humanity. My next example, Edward Blyden, 1872 to 1902, did not share this conviction at all. He was the forerunner of the version of Pan-Africanism which prescribed all people of full-blooded African origin, on this he was very of this he was very sure, to establish themselves in Africa. 
In this, he had the support of the white folks who led the African colonization society. He was a black West Indian who was trained as a Christian pastor. Ratkas, by the way, refused him. He, was, he really was quite undone by his first because he came from a pretty well-placed family in the West Indies. The, he trained as a Christian pastor and came to share the view, on the other hand, which is very unusual, of the importance of Islam for Pan-Africanism then and now. He was involved in establishing and sometimes leading US African states like Liberia and Sierra Leone. One of his many influential books is called Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race. So if Flora Shaw invoked Islamic Pan-Africanism, Blyden incorporated it within the Pan-African argument of diasporic African resettlement within Africa. Marcus Aurelius Garvey, as he finally came to call himself, his name was different, of course, 1847 to 1940, created a global movement to transport all Africans to the African continent and make them economically viable. This particular idea still has a hold on people's imagination. I was just asked at the Du Bois Library in Accra at the end of July by a young African-American teacher at the prestigious US private school of Choate, surrounded by his students, if Marcus Garvey was not the first thinker of Pan-Africanism, and if Du Bois did not come well after him. I told him, of course, that Du Bois's idea was that all African nations should gain independence from colonialism, leading on to a vision of all the world's colonies becoming free. Marcus Garvey's idea was to transport all Africans to the African continent. Garvey was tremendously charismatic and so taken by his idea that he became a self-described self -described fascist and was keen on Hitler as he thought to keep African blood pure and he believed that it was logical for his pure Africa movement to draw support from white purists like the Ku Klux Klan. To retrieve Du Bois's track to Pan-Africanism, we finally contrast it briefly to George Padmore, 1903 to 59. By the way, I made a typing error in, uh, in, Blyden's, in Blyden's dates. I, mean, I was noticing he would die when he was like 15 years old, if that were right. Who wrote a book called Pan-Africanism or Communism. He wrote many books, but he wrote this. By the way, uh, Kofi Aounor, as I was talking about him at the dinner table, who was uh, set there to mind Du Bois because he had just received a first class degree in English from Leeds, Aounor had. Now, he was terrified of Du Bois, of course, the young man. But he told me that Nkrumah told him, Dr. Du Bois, I really respect him and adore him and all of that stuff, but he's too much of a communist. I prefer Marcus Garvey. Now, I don't have any source for this except a conversation with Kofi Aounor, and he, alas, is now among the ancestors. He got killed at Westgate, but he did say this. The, um, anyway, Padmore adored Du Bois and was socialist by inclination. He identified communism with white people in his book, Communism, Communist Party, which is very different from his socialist inclinations, including Russia and perhaps even China, Whereas Du Bois thought of Russia and China as victims of varieties of extreme colonialism, as indeed was enslavement. In fact, his, which is not quite correct, but he does argue this from time to time. In fact, his peculiar understanding of Stalin as the child of millennial serfdom, because uh, Stalin's father had become free five years before Stalin was born. So the Stalin did not like Kamenev and Lenin and Trotsky and so on. He was not a bourgeois, well-educated in, well intellectual. He was coming from Serfstock. So his sense uh, the, um, and peculiar understanding of Stalin as the child of millennial serfdom, Stalin had been given so much control because of course the others didn't think of this. And as many of us, let us not compare ourselves to Stalin, but on the other hand, many of us know that those who do the work get given all the work. So to an extent, you know, but you have to think of, you know, how you're giving out the work, not only because this person likes to do everything from morning to night. So at any rate, it had peculiar consequences. 
Padmore was on many committees and therefore had a connection with actual planning and strategy among resistance groups. We know that type also. The, uh, and his sense of white people was that those who were anti-colonial in the metropolis were wonderful and to be trusted. Whereas the white people located in the colonies themselves fought hard to undo the reforms suggested by the good whites in the metropolis. Badmore's vision had no future. He was a fantastic man, but this vision has no future. I mean, I was born in colonial, um, in dependent India, and this is not really a way to go. Padmore's vision had no future, and indeed it was described by Fanon just a little bit later that the nationalist bourgeoisie, after the so-called national liberation, found their best friends among the good whites rather than the post-colonial underclass. In 1946, on the eve of Indian independence, Bhimrao Ramji Ambedkar, a member of the Viceroy's legal council, wrote Du Bois asking him about the possibility of an African-American petition to the UN, hoping to launch such a petition from the untouchables of India. Ambedkar, the framer of the Indian constitution, was from a so-called untouchable caste. Du Bois wrote back, saying he knew about untouchability, but the conversation did not go any further. For the attempt to put together such a petition died in the United Nations, as many of you might know. It was a broad thing. NAACP began, NAACP began it. There, and in fact, uh, it is a shameful fact that Eleanor Roosevelt opposed it. There is now a strong movement to bring African-American struggles together with the Dalit strike against caste prejudice. This is a good effort. But we also need to remember that post-colonialism and pan-Africanism, efforts at joining struggles, were anterior to the kind of class-specific collaboration that globality produces, the conference circuit, the class continuity, academic culture that, uh, that uh, glo globality produces. I believe that Du Bois did not go any further with Ambedkar because his understanding of pan-Africanism leading to the visionary world without colonialism, did not and could not offer him an opportunity to get into struggles interior to colonized space because it was necessary to see the colonized across the world as victims in order for this to be a sweepingly broad uh, movement which was very, very unusual, both uh, pan-Africanism as really the first preemptive post-colonialism. That position was not available. So the um, Du Bois's somewhat absurd novel, The Dark Princess, exoticizes an India that is hopelessly noble, even Aryanist. Brahminism, Buddhism, and Islam mixed up in an embarrassing and implausible way. It reflects the desire to overcome the class-specific problem of access to the subaltern and fails. When I use the word subaltern, I mean Gramsci's first definition, small social groups on the fringes of history. Small social groups on the fringes, this is Gramsci's words in English, on the fringes of history. Unfortunately, gruppi sociali, which is hardly difficult to translate as social groups, Quentin Hoare and Noel Smith translates this, translate this as class and screws it up. Okay, so please re remember this, uh, this definition that's in my head. Okay, so uh, Du Bois' Indian novel reflects the desire to overcome the class-specific problem of access to the subaltern and fails. It is a stand-up, you know, like you st stand up someone with whom you have a date. It is a stand-up or faux bon between Du Bois and Ambedkar. Chandler would no doubt dizzyingly theorize Derrida's extraordinary essay, Ya ou le faux bon, where the yes is staged as a stood up date between plan and performance. It's a fantastic piece. Therefore, Derrida urges in that early piece, il faut, I wish I had the time to go into the fault, faux, written into the must, il faut. A fantastic work. I mean, really 
focus those of us who do literary work, you know, word people, uh, there is something to say about being able to read so well. At any rate, so then Derrida goes on to say that we must uh, lutter pour transformation massive des appareils. We must fight. I didn't have the English translation, so I thought since I'm going to translate myself, I'll read the French uh, phrases. Uh, fight for massive transformation of the apparatus, work on many fronts in many rhythms. Pour tenir ensemble ces deux nécessités inégales, to hold these two unequal necess necessities together, et différencier systématiquement une pratique, and uh, systematically differentiate a practice, theoretical and political, writes Derrida, un bouleversement général s'impose, a general overturning imposes itself, not only as a theoretical or practical imperative, but already as a process during which we are invested, enveloped, um, uh, our borders are crossed in an unequal fashion. This is, I mean, I didn't do a good translation and it, this is too quick, but in fact, if anybody is engaged in activist work, they know very well that Derrida is describing a very major problem. You know, when you were describing about the, oh, by the way, the, um, you know, in this, that uh, uh, thing, I am indeed the only university professor in the humanities, but there is now another woman of color, fantastic woman, who is a university professor. It's Wafa El Sada, public um, health, wonderful woman. I just wanted to mention it, so it doesn't look like, okay, so when you do, when you do the, when you do the, uh, the uh, work together with people who are indeed subalterns, who will indeed say, look, we make too little money in order to follow this, etc., rather than just be like my wonderful friend Vandana Shiva and so on, top-down work, the, then it, this what Derrida just wrote about how it imposes upon it, it, uh, ourselves in an unequal way, and so therefore there's always a missed date between plan and uh, performance and so on, that I think Ch I let Chandler do some kind of a real thing between that and the missed date between Ambedkar and uh, Du Bois, because that exchange went nowhere. That was it. Both pre-digital and digital efforts at joining struggles are helped when there is a certain degree of class continuity on both sides. See, this is how the Global South has put itself on sale now. So that, in fact, the more or less the elite, that is to say, continuous in an academic culture with the European hosts, get, uh, get worked at as just get rewarded as the Global South in general, which is in itself quite scary for some of us. But at any rate, both pre-digital and digital uh, efforts at joining struggles are helped when there is a certain degree of class continuity on both sides. This usually relates to the leadership of the struggles. In Du Bois's library is a book on Gandhi, put together on Gandhi's 75th birthday, hand dedicated to Du Bois by Jawaharlal Nehru with his name wrong, as you can see, William E. B. Boyce, at any rate. Um, uh, the hand dedicated to Du Bois by Jawaharlal Nehru, our first prime minister. These are his connections, the connections enjoyed by Joseph Appia or Kofi Aounar. Du Bois's particular friend, as is very, very well known, is Lala Lajpatrai. These are broadly class continuous connections. Uh, Lala is a, a businessman, so therefore, I'm right, no? Uh, say I'm a Bengali, I'm not always, <laughs> always sure there's somebody else sitting here. Okay, so uh, Du Bois's particular friend is Lala Lajpatrai. These are broadly class continuous connections, as in the case of Du Bois, as in the case of the Du Bois Ambedkar connections being insisted upon along the conference circuit today. It is not just Harvard, Columbia, London School of Economics, that is to say Du Bois and Ambedkar, just top administrator as Ambedkar on the Viceroy's Legal Committee, just top administrator and world-class intellectual, not even that they were neither of them subaltern by birth. Du Bois was in the black middle class 
and Ambedkar's father was a subedar in the army, yet they both suffered from race caste discrimination when they stepped out into mixed territory. It is that Ambedkar wore his Brahmin teacher's surname, that's a Brahmin name which one of his teachers gave him, right? The uh, surname, and uh, as Du Bois shows us in his paternal genealogy, the 17th century Chrétien Du Bois was white. This is where Chandler's reading of Du Bois is, I mean, he gives us that thing, so I mean, we are supposed to notice it. Uh, this is where Chandler's reading of Du Bois's biography of John Brown, the abolitionist white man who gave his life for the, quote, Negro as African-American. John Brown is African-American, superb. You really, if you haven't read it, take a look at it. Yet it has to be noted that internal to the colonized space, Ambedkar is utterly justified in writing of Gandhi in the preface to the second edition of the Annihilation of Caste, and I quote, to many a Hindu he is an oracle, so great that when he opens his lips it is expected that the argument must close and no dog must bark. But the world owes much to rebels who would dare to argue in the face of the pontiff and insist that he is not infallible. So there is indeed a distinction but that distinction is within that struggle, and there Du Bois' postcolonial vision cannot go, and it's not Du Bois' fault. The connection then between parts joining struggles with, caste, uh, with class and caste continuity is generally metonymic. The leaders and the groups focusing on an issue and ramifications leaving other items, sometimes perhaps potentially divisive, out of bounds while the struggle is celebrated. I would, for example, metonymic, nimic, part for the whole, the uh, adjacent, I would join here with the feminists, no questions asked. But on the other hand, that sincere joining has almost no meaning, relevance, purchase, anything when I am with subaltern women, none. So therefore, it becomes, some of us can in fact, go from metonym to metonym, it's too easy to call it code switching, but some can't. So to an extent, that is in itself an activist skill, a flexibility of the imagination. In the case of the brief exchange between Du Bois and Ambedkar, class continuity was the first enabler. It was the metonymic obligation that backfired because they were both temperamentally and circumstantially in an amphibolic relationship with identitarianism. I have su suffered from racism as you from casteism did not catch fire. The Du Bois, and that's pretty much the formula for all these conferences. The uh, Du Bois had worked to take Africanity beyond the unique separator of enslavement. He took into account, as indeed did Marx, that in colonialism, slavery became an instrument, however out of sync, of the self-determination of capital. This allowed him to write it into the world historical discourse of Marxism, rewriting the color line by way of colonialism into brown, red, and yellow, as well as black. As a youthful, as, as a, as a youthful graduate student, Ambedkar, in the 1916 essay written for a graduate seminar, was rewriting caste into reproductive heteronormativity. It's an amazing essay, because you expect, even today, because you want everyone to love you, that you will say, look, look, I have suffered. You know, I, I'm, real, I'm, I'm an untouchable person. But, but Ambedkar writes this essay, trying to understand what would generalize it. So he writes this essay uh, for a graduate seminar at Columbia, was rewriting caste into reproductive heteronormativity. Caste was constituted, he argued, by the difference required in the treatment of surplus women and surplus men produced by enforced endogamy. And finally, studying the greatest tools of generalization as a member of the group that was not allowed to generalize into the world historical discourse of constitutionality. It's, it was the constitutional subject that he was really, as we were discussing, that he was really interested in putting together. And I think here, again, Chandler's idea that this is not just include the, the untouchables, include the lower castes, include the women. That's not the point. 
It's not the Gandhi people who are the same, and these are inclusions. He is, in fact, rewriting the, consti uh, the constitution of the general argument for constitutions, which is a very interesting way to look at this. The, and I think Ambedkar's life would bear this out. So he is actually, for those, those who are not allowed to generalize, to, to, to put them into the world historical discourse of constitutionality, this self-staging was shared by the two, but it was this very thing that did not allow Du Bois to check out the interior color line, so to speak, of the progressive bourgeoisie that could unite to call for an end to colonialism. It was Columbia to Harvard, as it were, not a commerce between individual ethnocultures. The former has expanded considerably, accompanying the expansion of diasporas as a direct consequence of immigration of the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 in the US, which abolished the quota system based on national origins that had been US immigration policies since the 1920s, supplemented by the accessibility enhanced by the digital. This is where we are now going back in the United States, of course. The, um, without deep language learning and awareness of cognitive damage resulting from the generalized exercise of millennial pre-colonial ethnocultural structures of power, connected struggle efforts are good against racism, but not against its legitimation by reversal, that is to say, essentializing the pre-colonial, which we see happening all across the board. The, so therefore, the, um, without deep language learning and awareness of cognitive damage resulting from the generalized exercise of millennial pre-colonial ethnocultural structures of power, connected struggle efforts are good against racism, but not against its legitimation by reversal, and do not support or engage with the slow and persistent work for building subaltern agency. From his handwritten notes in the pages of the African language related books in the core collection, the one that I showed you, of course there are about just under 2,000 uh, books, now neglected and open in unlocked cabinets in a small unlocked room without air conditioning, now open to imminent destruction and disappearance, Du Bois took these books with him to Ghana and when you, in his 90s, but when you look at the slow and persistent uh, notes that he takes in some of these books, I mean, this man in his 90s, and some, sometimes the notes cover pages and pages of frontispiece stuff, etc. He's really trying to learn something rather than just remain within a kind of idealizing framework. To, so Du Bois took with his, his awareness of the need to achieve cognitive continuity is impressive for any age, for he knew that need. Let me quote here a well-known passage, very well-known indeed, from Black Reconstruction. I quote, can we imagine this spectacular revolution, he writes, the, uh, about emancipation? Not, of course, unless we think of these people as human beings like ourselves. Not honest, assuming this common humanity, we could, uh, not unless assuming this common humanity, we conceive ourselves in a position, so it's not just they're like us, but the much harder one, we are like them. The, um, we conceive ourselves in a position where we are chattels, close to real estate, and then suddenly in the night become, quote, thenceforward and forever free. Unless we can do this, there is, of course, no point in thinking of the central figure in emancipation. And this is covered over too quickly by easy words like intersectionality and empathy. Those are labor-saving American words. And uh, so, you know, and this is, this, is a, this is a very different, this is a very different bag of beans. So he knows very well that that is needed. In order to imagine the hitherto enslaved imagination encountering freedom, Du Bois realizes that only the religious teleology can provide, Abiola Irele, by the way, has, you know, he died on July 3, but he has written and he has done me the honor of asking me to introduce this collection, a fantastic collection called uh, The African Scholar. And he writes something that many of you know, but it hadn't occurred to me, that one of the reasons why these uh, people so liked the Christian story was because it had a teleology. 
the transcendental narrative with the teleology. So the only that religious narrative could provide a world historical discourse that would allow the enslaved to sketch a collective psychobiography toward freedom bringing religion to crisis. His text, however, stages a failure of access to that mindset, that epistemology. This is a strength of the text. This is exactly not Dark Princess. This is a strength of the text, that it keeps class difference alive, rather than claim it all, as our collective struggles sometimes do. There are analytic philosophers today who go forward to say, oh, yes, I can uh, touch all the people, because analytic philosophy does not invite you to think about the position of the philosopher. So you can just, and, uh, we literary folks feel like quoting Shakespeare. You know, where uh, Glendar, was it, claims, uh, I can call the spirits from the vasty deep. And uh, Hotspur, I think, says, why? So can I, so can anyone. But when you do call, do they answer you? <laughs> See, that's, that's very different from that sort of empathy baggage. So therefore, the, uh, the relevant, so he stages that failure so that there can be future work, you remember, Marx's extraordinary sentence, the revolution of the 19th century will take its content from the poetry of the future. The form we all know, value form, but the labor theory of value, empty, contentless. But the content comes from the poetry of the future because we can't think it yet. These are, these are his words. So the, uh, the relevant chapter is the coming of the Lord. Uh, however disciplinarily untrained I might be, I'm a believer in at least understanding as a lay person, as we live in this globalized world today, how macro structures operate to run our lives. The play of a globalized world within which we are played. Some years ago, I used to speak of, quote, transnational literacy, quite a few decades ago, as an imperative for humanities students and scholars. For some time now, I have been speaking of a persi persistent familiarization with the scandal of deregulation and the annulled laws, the Glass-Steagall being, of course, the foremost in the United States. The difference between commercial and investment banks disappeared slowly, I mean, as uh, the Reagan-Bush era slowly dismantled the welfare state. This was the last one, and we began to have the crisis that shook the world. The, um, on the other hand, if we do not learn how to supplement this, we forget that the world is made up of people, that only being played is not enough, that law is not justice. Education must produce a desire for social justice, to use capital for social ends, and that that imaginative flexibility is taught only through the relentless practice of, quote, reading, at which I have gestured in many references to textility, textile-like weaving, wovenness. We have been in a world wide web in a sense quite different from that promoted by the search engines, saving intellectual labor at the top as the search engines do, just as the nation builders do not take into account that intellectual labor is denied rather than saved at the bottom. At the top, intellectual labor is saved, digital idealism. I should know, I teach the humanities, trivialized out of recognition. So, the, so at the top that, and at the bottom, intellectual labor is denied. So you have a problem if you teach both at the top and at the bottom. I refer you to a slightly dated piece called What is to be Done, written by myself, published some years ago in Tidal, the journal of the now defunct group called Occupy Wall Street in an earlier dispensation. Supplement. I say that we should supplement all of the literacy into knowing about regulating capital and so on and so forth, we should supplement this with the humanities conviction that affect has a place, desire for social justice has to be developed against the general, I say that it's a dehumanizing work. People say I'm a wonderful humanist, but I don't have that much confidence in the human being. The, with the human being, the Anthropocene starts. So therefore, this, this is something that is a supplement. A supplement points out that all totalities are incomplete. In other words, it points out, that's what we were reading in Le Faubon. In other words, it points out the obvious fact 
that micro and macro structural explanations are existentially impoverished and therefore incomplete. In order to, you do need statistics, but you cannot think that they describe the world. And unfortunately, what is getting done is supposedly, I'm very deeply involved in so-called development work, R&D. See, the convenience of calculation cannot make you forget that supposedly you are working on real people. So it's no use saying, I'm not against statistics, but you cannot be for statistics alone. As I think I was saying perhaps in conversation that in the 90s, Mehbubul Haq and Amartya Sen put in life expectancy and education in order to develop what they called a human development index. In the 2013 Human Development Index report called The Rise of the South, the statisticians, because they were totally removed from these uh, kinds of ideas, said we are removing um, uh, education and life expectancy because they're too inconvenient for statistical calculation. I mean, it was amazing. In other words, they had no idea that that's, they were put in because they were inconvenient, because supposedly we are talking about human beings. So therefore, I'm not just being some kind of a gaga old lady who just writes, uh, likes reading literature. If we are thinking about really development rather than inserting everyone into the circuit of capital without any preparation for managing it, like our own government opens bank accounts, Swanirbhar Dal, Swanirbhar. I mean, they don't even understand what that damn thing means. So anyway, a supplement points out that all totalities are incomplete. In other words, points out the obvious fact that macro and micro structural explanations are existentially impoverished and therefore incomplete. They must not be rejected. They must be persistently supplemented by our multidisciplinary effort. Supplement must also know precisely how to fit the gap in the totality. You know, sometimes only as a joke, and since this is a one-shot deal, I can't explain what I mean. I say that both international socialism and international capitalism share an ethics-shaped whole. You know, so and the supplement must know the exact nature of the whole. Top-down philanthropy is not ethics. Unconditional ethics and top-down philanthropy have very little to do with each other. And tax breaks are also not ethical. They, and these are the folks who get into the, you, who get celebrities, such and so gave so much money, etc. Uh, okay, so also knowing that this sense is vulnerable, it must be constantly devised and revised. Thus a supplement has to take into account that one byproduct project to social justice or expectation can be this ethics-shaped whole and the inability to send out in the epistemological space to those whom these systems of justice or expectation are apparently helping. But supplement also takes into account that human subjectivity is not limited to deliberate and intentional agency alone. And thus, when it comes, the, uh, comes to be that the dangerous sentiment of the incalcul incalculable comes in, then if we stop these sentiments, we have no business running any kind of a project. I'll give you an example. Uh, this morning, uh, I was paid, I said something about being old, and I was paid, I'm 75, which is, you know, it's, a, it's roughly an old age. So it's, I have no problem with it. I was paid extra, extravagant um, uh, compliments about, no, you're not old with your uh, energy and with your, uh, you know, um, uh, vigor and with your statements and so on. Now, I'm quite sure the person who was talking to me did not intend anything but a compliment, but in anything, but implicitly, of course, what it carried was a total disregard for old age. So therefore, to an extent, and that when, that, when it works like this against intention, that is ideology at work. That is to say, you breathe in certain ideas and then you think, you know, I hope there's nobody here who will mind an obscene word. But one of the jokes that we used to carry with us in the 60s was this guy who really thought he was a feminist in a, in a Lower East Side bar, two wives and two uh, husbands, and he really thought that he, and he genuinely felt all of this. Somebody used bad language and he said, hey, don't use language, there are cunts present. 
See, now this, he really wanted. See, most people were so shocked that they couldn't laugh. But at any rate, <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. The, it's all right. The, um, so therefore, this idea that you can, that the, the supplement can be dangerous and incalculable when it's actually uh, questioning your very sentiments to supplement. This is something that you encounter in activism. I mean, I don't want to take too long. I almost have taken up all my time. But let me just say this. For example, when, when I work with in, in these areas, and I'm there sometimes eight or nine times a year, the idea of child marriage, you know, laws are passed, but after all, there's no social security. So that to an extent, the, for the sake of social security and not because they don't like their daughters, etc., they will marry them off very young. And there was no way that you could just kind of go and talk about human dignity, etc., when they are not given any damn thing and certainly no idea of human dignity in the way in which they are made otherwise to work. So it's words. And they know that the ruling class says these absurd things, so they would agree and smile. But by now, I have earned a different kind of place with them, I hope, not for long, I don't think, but nonetheless. Finally, it came to me that if I compared this uh, sending away the girls so young with the fact that they do not use the animals that young to breed, See, if we were talking about it here, it would be post-humanist, you see, because you're really talking about animals to be like. But over there, oh, they're like dogs and pigs. They really are not human because you have to talk about animals. You see, that is also very clear to someone who teaches both at Columbia and in Birhum. But so, and then I began to see that it was beginning to catch on. I don't know that I've had a huge success or that I would say to every international civil society to go and say, hey, be like animals, be like animals, because that's another, another one of those labor-saving uh, devices. You learn the formula, you know, strategic use of essentialism. <laughs> so <laughs> the, thing, the, thing is, the thing is, it's true. Everybody knows everything. But nonetheless, you know, it didn't come to me easily. You know, I'm a metropolitan humanist intellectual, uh, 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 daughter of plain living, high thinking intellectual parents who taught us to despise the rich, anti-casteists. For me to learn to think this thought was not easy. But on the other hand, you know, if you are not just going to say, and I'm on the experts committee on economic growth and social inclusion of the World Economic Forum. You have no idea how these people who make so much money constantly talk about human dignity. Human dignity is a very doubtful phrase. Anyway, so I wish I could share with you the way in which we read not only a printed page, but also the world in a microtextual way in order to keep the world moving democratically rather than just being played by macrostructures, even when well-regulated by policy. Du Bois's text stages an inability to imagine the subalt subaltern episteme in this chapter from which I read that, uh, that passage, and I don't have the time to read it with you. Stateless social groups on the fringe of history to remind ourselves of Gramsci's formula as it prepares to step into citizenship. The, I hope there are literary, uh, well, nobody looks quite like a, the age of a student, but nonetheless, if there are, if there are, you know, we are students all our lives, but uh, if there are literary students, I do want to say one thing, okay? That when you read this, this uh, chapter, uh, Coming of the Lord, in where he stages this, eh? What the thing to really look for, and this is really a very literary thing I'm going to say, on the second page, there is an unclaimed bit of free and direct discourse. Free indirect discourse for which there is no character. Simply a declarative. It is the coming of the Lord. And you notice right at the end, this free indirect discourse is shown to be unclaimable. It, this is, I mean, he's, he's a fantastic writer when he's writing seriously. It's, this is a really moving thing. Anyway, so I can't read it, however. Um, but this inability cannot be imagined or staged in the case of the interiority of the post-colonial. As I said, Lumumba and Fano, the tall one and the short, 
both of whom came to the 1958 All African People's Congress, the first one on African space, need to be remembered here. They were both deeply aware of the internal ethnic problems of the post-colonial system, post-colonial nation. We also have to remember that Ambedkar could not imagine Palestine. So there are these limits to, uh, to imaginative flexibility, which we, those of us who teach the humanities seriously, must teach epistemological performance, um, imaginative flexibility. That's all we can do. So he wrote small interventions comparing the image between slavery and untouchability, and it's not a question of comparison. This is for ourselves to be aware that there are deep historical limitations to the flexibility of our own identities. This point of view that I've been trying to push from the 80s, the late 70s, starting with my reading of Charlotte Bronte, but I haven't succeeded in making the aggressively post-colonial people take into account our production within an enabling violation. Imperialism as children of rape, enabling violation. Everybody loves the Buccia Mecheta's novel, Rape of Shavi, stages this. She has the courage to, uh, to, to stage this imperialism as enabling violation. Everybody loves epistemic violence and so on. So we can point fingers, you know, bad whites, bad whites, good us. But that enabling violation thing is too dangerous. It hasn't been picked up. So at any rate, the... Um, just uh, um, this morning, my, professor, my friend Professor Mark van Hagen sent me an email saying that someone writing about Ukrainian literature had cited me. I noticed that she had cited a statement made in the 90s, which I really couldn't support. Today, I speak of affirmative sabotage. The only problem with this is that the claimant, as usual, comes to claim this much too easily. But that's what Du Bois and um, Ambedkar both do with the European Enlightenment. Affirmative sabotage. It's not like they are influenced by the European Enlightenment. It is to take the European Enlightenment to a place where it needs to be reconstituted because its definition of the agent is imperfect and incomplete. It's not like we are the different people who must be included in your program. That's what Chandler teaches us. So this inability to imagine the uh, interiority of a class-fixed post-colonial, all sites, does not stop castes being extremely useful as a phrase for the pan-Africanists. And so, the, because it's neither class nor race, Padmore certainly uses it in many critical passages, so does Du Bois. The most critical use by Du Bois is in his 1948 rejection of the concept of the talented 10th. It's a piece that is entitled The Talented 10th, which he's giving at Hampton, and he writes, turn now to that complex of social problems which surrounds and conditions our life and which we call more or less vaguely the Negro problem. It is clear that in 1900, American Negroes were an inferior caste, he writes, were frequently lynched and mobbed, widely disfranchised, and usually segregated in the main areas of life. As student and worker at that time, I looked upon them and saw salvation through intelligent leadership, as I said, through a talented tenth. And for this intelligence, I argued, we needed college-trained men. Therefore, I stressed college and higher training. For these men with their college training, there would be needed true understanding of the mass of Negroes and their problems, and therefore, I emphasized scientific study. Willingness to work and make personal sacrifice for solving these problems, Du Bois continues, was of course the first prerequisite and sine qua non. I did not stress this, I assumed it. I assumed that with knowledge, sacrifice would automatically follow. You know whom he's quoting. He knew German stuff uh, very, very well indeed. He's quoting Kant's What is Enlightenment? With freedom, with uh, uh, what shall I call it? With enlightenment, freedom is almost sure to follow. I think that's those the nouns are placed like that. I may be wrong because Du Bois knew, knows this better. Sacrifice would automatically follow. In my youth and idealism, he wrote, I did not realize that selfishness is even more natural than sacrifice. I made the assumption of its wide availability because of the spirit of sacrifice learned in my mission school training. 
So he takes it back. He becomes, and he uses, you notice, the word caste. So the word caste is very useful for him. It's not, as he writes in the letter, he's aware of untouchability. But he cannot really enter that kind, those ethnic uh, places. And I must also say that uh, when Yashuvant, uh, Yashudat alone, who's uh, an upwardly class mobile Dalit writer, nice guy, but certainly class-wise he's continuous with me rather than with the subaltern, he wrote that the use of the, he was faulting me, which is fine too, that the use of the word subaltern is too much about class and it doesn't really look at the Dalit at all, the uh, so-called untouchables, so-called tribals, aboriginals at all. And so, therefore, this, I acknowledge his, I acknowledge his, um, his, uh, his objection. Now, where then do we connect the two? I mean, there is something more to be said, but I think I have almost come to an hour. So I'm not going to read Kamala Vishweshwaran's questions. She has a very beautiful, strong piece, which you should look at, which is called Race in South Africa. And the, um, and the thing is, the subtitle is wonderful, Counter Genealogical Subaltern Sociology. You should take a look at this uh, thing. She's written on Du Bois uh, and Ambedkar. Oops, it's because I put this on the thing. But, uh, but I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to say that this constitutionality of the subject, this relationship to the Enlightenment. These are the ways in which these two gigantic figures genuinely do relate, not in terms of identity politics supported by academic class continuity. This will be hard for us. There are some different kinds of uh, conferences that we will not get money from, from the melons and so on, because of course they do think that this is very good because it's anti-racist, so good conscience for the crooks. But on the other hand, the, uh, we have to really think about what we are doing and where this, if the subaltern even understands what is being said, and certainly neither Du Bois nor, uh, nor um, um, Ambedkar actually wo works through in this way. And you can't just make parallels, like Northrop Fry said. Compare the string quartet and the spider, because they both have eight legs. So, <laughs> therefore, I will close with a another very strong, a very strong connection between the two of them, this mind-changing, not mind-changing so much as a flexible education even for the very poor, not just income production. And this idea that, you know, the em emancipated slave needs food, clothing, and shelter, but at once, this is in dusk of dawn, to communicate with the stars, very well-known passage. To, uh, when Ambedkar, at the end of his life, uh, uh, converts to Buddhism, because Buddhism for us was uh, a sign for um, secularism, a sign for uh, equality, a sign for sharing, and so on. I, if uh, he had been alive, I would have talked to him about Burma, about Thailand, about uh, Sri Lanka, and said that you cannot, in fact, uh, just because you are opposing a bad system, you cannot say to all of your followers, he knew what he was doing, but the followers just simply hypostatized a certain kind of religion, and that's not the way that you get into the world historical through religion. But at any rate, when he was doing this, he wrote a thing called uh, Buddha or Marx. Again, if he were around, I would, it was quite clear that he was reading Marx in very poor English translation. If he were around, then I would sit with him and be very, very insolent and rude and so on, and talk about, talk about the Marx part. But in the Buddha part, he quotes in Pali, the Tipitaka, and he talks about, and it's of course translated into English, and it's translated as learning without character is dangerous. That word character is absolutely disgracefully poor. The word he uses is sila, you know, like in Panchsila, et cetera, which is in Sanskrit, shila, right? And that's a very complicated word. Learning without that cooking of the soul is dangerous. Eh? So this Du Bois and Ambedkar are genuinely connected in, uh, and Fanon, if, uh, chapter three, in not the first chapter misunderstood by Sartre. The, so this, this idea 
of a religion, of an education that's going to mold the mind and the imagination into flexibility rather than just ask for my justified rights. This, this puts Ambedkar and, uh, and um, uh, Du Bois together. And so I will just, this will be the last thing I do and I won't say anything about Kamla. Let me just say that this comradeship, this word Sila, I want, again, I'm only an, a literature teacher and I even like Shakespeare as you can see. I'm going to ask you to think about the word bond in King Lear. It, that sila is like that, a very unusual word. I mean, and the quote is, unhappy that I am, Cordelia says to Lear. I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond. That's sila. Yeah? So, you know, affective value uh, leading to social justice rather than just an unreasonable kind of tough love type uh, statement. And I have, and then Rear, of course, doesn't understand. How, how, Cordelia? Mend your speech a little, lest it may mar your fortune. But I'm not interested in fortune, sir. I love you according to my bond. And, and, and the final statement is from a subaltern, cultural conformism, he's not a revolutionary. But I heard the song, the song which, in fact, I once sang, Michael, when you introduced me. But I'm not going to sing it. So <laughs> the, the line, the line is, Mon kare uribar tare, mind makes as if to fly. Bidhi daena pakha. Huh? Bidhi doesn't give wings. Now that word bidhi is like that sila, like bond, extremely heavily charged words that can mean all kinds of things and you don't want to have a synonym too quickly. You have to think it through. And, so, and that's what we teach. So to an extent, what, where Ambedkar and Du Bois connect is finally in this peculiar supplementing place where there are, for now, there are more, but for now, this, these three related incalculable words, bond, sila, and bidhi. Thank you. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Don't clap, don't clap. There's something else. There's something else, the next one. See, I just wanted to show you this because, you know, this is, where that millenarian stuff, Islamic millenarianism, is at its best. That's the Emir of Ilorin, you know, the Muslim king of Ilorin, wonderful guy. When I go to see him, he of course tells his, all his students, the, uh, students, all the people in his palace, this is in his palace, in his palace he says, she doesn't have to cover her head and she doesn't have to take off her shoes because he knows not only that I'm not a Muslim but that I'm an atheist. So therefore, I always cover my head and I always take off my shoes. And that is our wonderful Abiola Irele who died on the 3rd of July. And that, of course, you, everybody knows who that is, Bole Shoinka. He was being given a, on, an honorary degree by Abdul Rashid Nahalla, the vice chancellor of Kwara State University, small rural university where we do a certain project and work which I didn't talk about, but would if I were giving two lectures, etc. Now, why is he wearing a suit? He's a practicing Muslim, always prays five times a day, always wears Muslim clothes. But at any rate, why is he wearing a suit? He always wears uh, Muslim clothes. Because, remember, he, he's being given an, uh, an honorary doctorate. It's the commencement of his university. And he wants to make the point that it's a secular university, not a Muslim university. Therefore, he goes to visit the Muslim king of Ilorin wearing a suit. Now that's the way one relates with the Enlightenment, instrumentally. It, you know what I mean? So I just wanted to show you this for these three things. One, to show Abiola, who has in fact a fantastic word which relates here, and I want to be able to comment on it when I, which is Africa leads not only good leadership, he's coined this word, but good followership. He's all, he was also a humanities teacher. That followership, following, that's what I was talking about. And I wanted to show the incredibly humane Muslim king in that area. And I wanted to show the use of European instrumentality. I mean, the Fulanis were coming in with those, you know, silvery thingies, et cetera, et cetera. But he was making that point, old Abdul Rashid. And of course, I'm standing there happily smiling, as you can see. 
and I, since you see me happily smiling here, you don't have to pay any attention to me except that my head is covered because he said you don't need to cover your head. Now, thank you very much and let's <laughs> end. Yeah, but do you and, have time? And, <laughs> do you want to do it yourself? Uh, but if you want to field it, it's fine too. It doesn't matter to me, really. We have time for a few questions. No, do, I don't have a pencil. No, I do have a pencil. I have a pencil. Don't worry. Thank you. Be careful. Hello, uh, thank Hi. you so much for your talk. I'm Kira Thurman at the University of Michigan in the United States and an Anna Maria Kellen Fellow here at the American Academy in Berlin. Um, I just wanted to um, ask about, I love the phrase that you used, affirmative sabotage. Mm. Um, and I was just wondering if you would be willing to sort of talk a little bit more about it or sort of how you came to it. Because um, I think it's such a really wonderful way of ensuring that as you already said, we're not a sort of assuming that people like Du Bois were influenced by the European Enlightenment, but so much as sort of uh, in, engaging with it. So I just wanted to sort of well, ask you more about that. Fantastic question. Can I take three quick, and I want short questions like this one, important short questions. Hi, I'm Jessica Nordell. I'm a journalist. I'm a guest of a, a fellow here, Sugi Ganeshanathan. Um, and I have a quick question for you. You mentioned that uh, the word empathy is not adequate to encompass what Du Bois described as necessary for emancipation, which was seeing the self in the other and also seeing the other in the, in the self. Do we have a word in English that is adequate? OK, good question again. And I'm an English teacher. I should be able to give you something. Three. Hi, um, I'm a fellow here too, Thomas Chatterton Williams, and my question is really short. Um, can you just expand on essentializing uh, the pre-colonial through, through anti-racism movements? Essentializing, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, now, affirmative sabotage. You're right, it's a you, very useful phrase. I'm not saying that they were not influenced. You know, I mean, of course, I mean, of course they were influenced. I mean, influence is okay. Well, it, the, such big, wonderful movements that had time, the theory of the leisure class, you know, the leisure of the theory class is what one says. So, yeah, why? No, that's fine. But then to say, and this I think is the problem that my friend Anthony Appiah has with his really fantastic, wonderful, meticulously researched book. But it is as if everything was just learned from you know, the souls of black folk, were, the word folk was nothing but uh, folk from his German uh, training, etc., etc. And so what it is, is the, the idea of sabotage originally, okay, but I'm not going to do the originally here. I'm speaking in English, that's why I used that phrase, because that word exists in English. But English is not the only language I speak in to people. So the, let's say, therefore, originally, sabote was to, with those sabots, uh, sabots that the very poor or the workers wore, uh, they to kick the machine into not being, not uselessness. Okay, but on the other hand, it is possible, and Chandler really theorizes it beautifully, to know the uh, material so well, the machine, so well that you can actually turn the machine around to do something for which it was not designed. Then you are using, you see, this is a general policy, and as a general part, but the only thing about this, and this may take up your time, you really have to know what you are undoing very well. First of all, you have to know the hole that you're supplementing, remember? So the, what kind of shape does it have? And so the bottom layer, if they can begin to turn around what they know well uh, from the top, as it were, again, so you do not accuse, 
but you do not excuse. You enter the thing so well, you find its weak point. If it's good, there will be a point that's useful against its own rules and regulations. You inhabit that space, turn it around, and start using it. That's affirmative sabotage. Em empathy. Well, the thing is, you see, I actually uh, think the uh, empathy uh, distinguishes itself from sympathy because somehow it is much more like really get, uh, but it's only a word which has E-M in front of it. It actually, you don't, just by using that word, you know, it's like uh, Wittgenstein. Did Wittgenstein actually say this? That you don't learn the piano with one piano lesson. See, you, I mean, during the Women's March, uh, just after Trump came in, the intersectionality. Hey, inter and you know, I was uh, in Washington that day, and then we were sitting down, and there was this Nigerian sister who was saying, you know, the thing is, yeah, they were good-hearted, and suddenly they would remember, oops, we've got to be intersectional. And then all of a sudden, everybody is looking at us. You see, it, you don't, these things have to become habits of the mind. Habits of the mind. I mean, this so that you don't really need a word. Oh, the old-fashioned word, sympathy, compassion, those are good words. But words are not enough. I mean, of course, nobody will allow you to use that word because they've been degraded and demoted, and you have the word empathy, which somehow seems to cover everything, but it doesn't. What happens is that people think that equality means sameness. The fact that the diachrony of people is quite different and that the common sense of, I mean, this morning's uh, conversation, for example, and it seemed clear that I would not know uh, anything about uh, the Western situation. See, it's, so therefore, the idea of, uh, and it was not intentional. That's something that one must absolutely learn, not to fault people and kneecap people, but see that, I mean, there are some people who are awful, but they, that's, that's a different thing, different bag of beans. So from that point of view, it seems to me that it's not the alternative word, word use that I will give you. And uh, Michael, can I just tell a little story and then go to the third one and then I'll be done. See, I used to work for uh, the uh, farm work workers unions, Texas farm workers union, when I taught at, as a paralegal, when I taught at, at Texas. And there was, you know, the women, especially women sections, and there was, uh, the, the workers were generally Spanish speaking, right? And but very powerful Maria, we had like really talked to her, et cetera, et cetera. She was gonna make a deposition in the state house in, in English. So we were okay, we, we had talked, and so she was on her own. We were not uh, coaching her or anything. But she's using the word ladies, okay? I mean, uh, that's the English that she's speaking. She's speaking powerfully. There was this strange woman who comes up, and remember, when I say white, I'm not talking a color. I'm talking a set of attitudes. So this, uh, this woman comes up, you know, and says, ah, you can't say uh, ladies, that's uh, really bad. We now must call ourselves women and stuff like that. Good word, see? So, I mean, we are so angry, we are ready to take her to the cleaners. But there was, a, there was a lawyer with us, Lee Taylor. She somehow managed the whole thing, and the deposition was given, all was well. Later, this woman gives me a card. I forget her name, but let's say Sandra Anderson, feminist. Card-carrying feminist, okay? <laughs> so the, the thing is, the thing is, the, the idea of words, it's a good idea that you ask, you're a journalist, you have to watch the language. But the idea of words changing, I mean, you notice I said enslaved. You know, a sister said to me when I was using, using the word slave that it's, you know, I don't think the use of a word changes practice. But I'm not against using uh, good words. I don't think empathy is a good word, I, but I think enslaved is a good word. You know, you don't uh, define or describe the human being as a slave. It was something that someone else did to that person. So I'm not against good word use. But here, for example, I'm regularly called Mrs. Spivak. We worked 50 years to take that damn uh, word away. <laughs> Okay, and so why, why? I, and, and then it's explained to me because I'm an old lady of color, I'm, I'm either an infant or an idiot. You know, so it's explained, it's a translation of the word in French, madame. It's a translation of the word frau. And I, I don't know that. That's what I'm asking you not to do, man. You speak English well. Even the US government knows to say, Miss, what's your problem? Anyway, so I'm not 
against, I'm not against word, good word use. But what I'm trying to say is it's a double bind. You do not change your mind. You should go to South Africa to find this out. You do not change, just change in laws or change in word use, do not change your mind. So I would just offer the old words, but they won't do anything anymore. The essentializing the pre-colonial. You see, this idea that oppression began with the play of capital and colony. And we were good and clean and really ecological and the women had real power. You know, you can more or less put in different words, but you, you can describe any pre-colonial society more or less in the same terms. They are individualistic, we were communal, etc. All of that comes in. And what happens is that we do not pay the compliment to the pre-colonial to study it carefully. The, uh, the idea of hierarchy and power, and you know, I was just using the word hierarchy or even perhaps class, but my friend Aloysius Denkabe in, at the University of Ghana, Legon, he said, Gaitri, use the word power, okay, because class already uh, kind of fixes it into a certain kind of arena. So therefore, I can see that you might think that you should essentialize the pre-colonial as really a good place which the colon colonial screwed. But in fact, in our own case, the idea of willing collaboration, that section, you know, and I've been working, I mean, obviously work in India, and obviously I've been working in Africa now for quite some time. So this particular situation of seeing that, for example, the languages that are dying, it's not because somebody came and killed the languages. It's also, it's true that English became the language of general communication, etc. But there had to be some kind of agreement on the part of the language users to decide that they were not going to use that language even in a private capacity. That, so therefore, this is, I work with a small uh, pilot group at this Kwara State University who are completely rural people from uh, Malete around there. And so therefore I learn something from them uh, in the way in which they're talking about how they are themselves elite. Of course, we would not call them elite but they perceive themselves as elite because they're in the university and then they go into, go into uh, to the area to talk to the people who speak the unsystematized mother tongues. So uh, the, the essentializing the pre-colonial, it seems to me that it's sometimes necessary in the diaspora for other kinds of reasons. But I don't think it ever does any good in terms of political practice. It only uh, points fingers. And it's generally, I think, a problem when the very, the, the subaltern needs to be inserted into the circuit of citizenship, which quite often does not resemble the pre-colonial that screwed them. So therefore, it's a, I think it's a bad idea. To, it's bad scholarship. Generally, people don't know any languages when they do this. And it's also uh, bad policy leads to bad politics and it excludes the subaltern who's actually sometimes living in a certain kind of pre-colonial uh, dispensation, a conjuncture which is kept apart because they're the largest sectors of the electorate, their bodies are counted for electing bad leaders, therefore they exist in a space which sometimes mixed up resembles the pre-colonial sum. So therefore that's why I'm not into uh, essentializing the pre believe me, the Indian pre-colonial can be essentialized into an incredible kind of, kind of, you know, dark princess. But uh, I mean, I'm, we could do it, no? You and I, if we suddenly decided that we were going to go into this, you know, walla walla walla, etc. So, but it's not worth it. It's, it's true. So the thing is, therefore, uh, the, uh, that's my advice in terms of the, our desire to say home was better. You know what I mean? And this place ain't good. It doesn't take you too far and does harm to others. Thank you very much.